Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, Chapter 6, Text 20, Translation and Commentary by His Divine Grace, Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. <coughs> Padaha, Triaha, Bahihi, Cha, Asan, Aprajanam, Ye, Ashramaha, Antaha, Tri, Lokyaha, Tu, Aparaha, Griha, Medhaha, Abrihat, Rataha, Padas Trio Bahis Chasan. Aprajanam ya Aprajanam ya ashramaha Antastri lokyast vaparo Griha medho brihadvrataha Padastrayo bahis chasan Aprajanang ya ashramaha aha. Ash ashramaha. That should be. There should be. Should be a long a at the end of the word ashramaha. Antastri lokyastvaparo. Griha medho bridhad vrata vrataha. Okay, someone else please chant. Janam ya ashramaha. Antastri Lokya Stvaparo Hamedho Brihadvrataha Padastrayo Bahischasan Aprajanam Ya Ashramaha Antastri Lokya Stvaparo Griha medho brihad vrataha Padastrayo bahis chasan Aprajanam ya ashramaha Antastri lokyastvaparo Griha medho brihadvrataha. Anyone else? Ladies? Padas trioba his chasan. Aprajanang ya ashramaha. Antastri Lokyas Twaparo Griya Medho Brihadvrataha Padastrayo Bahis Chasan Aprajanam Ya Ashramaha Antastri Lokyas Twaparo Griha medho brihadvrataha Padaha Triaha The cosmos of three fourths of the Lord's energy Bahihi Thus situated beyond Cha And for all Asan 
व अप्रजानाम of those who are not meant for rebirth ye those ashramaha status of life antaha within trilokyaha of the three worlds to but aparaha others griha medaha attached to family life abrihat rataha without strictly following a vow of celibacy watch yeah please just listen don't record the recording is done here The spiritual world which consists of 3/4 of the lord's energy is situated beyond this material world and it is especially meant for those who will never be reborn others who are attached to family life and do not strictly follow celibacy vows must live within the three material worlds purport the climax of the system of varnashram dharma or sanatan dharma is clearly expressed here in this particular verse of Srimad Bhagavatam the highest benefit that can be awarded to a human being is to train him to be detached from sex life particularly because it is only due to sex indulgence that the conditioned life of material existence continues birth after birth human civilization in which there is no control of sex life is a fourth class civilization because in such an atmosphere there is no liberation of the soul encaged in the material body birth death old age and disease are related to the material body and they have nothing to do with the spirit soul but as long as the bodily attachment for sensual enjoyment is encouraged the individual spirit soul is forced to continue the repetition of birth and death on account of the material body which is compared to garment subjected to the law of deterioration <coughs> in order to award the highest benefit of human life the varnashram system trains the follower to adopt the vow of celibacy beginning from the order of brahmachari The brahmacharya life is for students who are educated to follow strictly the vow of celibacy. Youngsters who have had no taste of sex life can easily follow the vow of celibacy, and once fixed in the principle of such a life, one can very easily continue to the highest perfectional stage, attaining the kingdom of the three fourths energy of the Lord. It is already explained that in the cosmos of the three four of three fourths energy of the Lord, there is neither death nor fear. and one is full of the blissful life of happiness and knowledge a householder attached to family life can easily give up such a life of sex indulgence if he has been trained in the principles of the life of a brahmachari a householder is recommended to quit home at the end of 50 years panchas or dvang vanang vrijit and live a life in the forest then being fully detached from family affection he may accept the order of renunciation as a sannyasi fully engaged in the service of the lord any form of religious principles in which the followers are trained to pursue the vow of celibacy is good for the human being because only those who are trained in that way can end the miserable life of material existence the principles of nirvana as recommended by lord buddha are also meant for ending the miserable life of material existence and this process in the highest degree is recommended here in the shrimad bhagavatam with clear perception of ideal perfection although basically there is no difference between the process of buddhists shankarites and vaishnavites for for promotion to the highest status of perfection namely freedom from birth and death anxiety and fearfulness not one of these processes allows the follower to break the vow of celibacy The householders and persons who have deliberately broken the vow of celibacy cannot enter into the kingdom of deathlessness. The pious householders or the fallen yogis or the fallen transcendentalists can be promoted to the higher planets within the material world, one fourth of the energy of the Lord, 
but they will fail to enter into the kingdom of deathlessness. Abrihadvratas are those uh, who have broken the vow of celibacy. The Vanaprastas are those retired from family life, and the sannyasis or the renounced persons cannot break the vow of celibacy if they want success in the process. The brahmacharis, vanaprastas, and sannyasis do not intend to take rebirth, apraja, apraja, nor are they meant for secretly indulging in sex life. Such a fall down by the spiritualist may be compensated by another chance for human life in good families of learned brahmanas or rich merchants for another term of elevation. But the best thing is to attain the highest perfection of deathlessness as soon as the human form of life is attained. Otherwise, the whole policy of human life will prove to be a total failure. Lord Chaitanya was very strict in advising his followers in the matter of celibacy. One of his personal attendants, Chota Haridas, was severely punished by Lord Chaitanya because of his failure to observe the vow of celibacy. For a transcendentalist, therefore, who at all wants to be promoted to the kingdom beyond material miseries, it is worse than suicide to deliberately indulge in sex life, especially in the renounced order of life. Sex life in the renounced order of life is the most per perverted form of religious life, and such a misguided person can only be saved if by chance he meets a pure devotee. <laughs> Om Ajnana Timirandha Syakyana Anjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Shrishtam Manamapi Shachi Putra Matra Swarupam Rupam Tasyagada Murupurim Maturim Goshtavartim Radha Kundam Girivaramaho Radhika Matava Sham Prapto yasya pratita kripaya shri gurum tam natosmi. Vande hum shri guru shri ataf padakamalam shri guru navaishnavansha shri rupam sagraja tam sahagana raghuna tan vitam tam sajivam sadvaitam savadhutam parijana sahitam krishna tehanya devam shri radha krishna padan. Sahagana Lalita Shivishakan Vitams Chat. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Before coming here, I got a message that I was asked to give a brahmachari class. I thought this was a suitable verse to speak on for a brahmachari class. You might agree with that assessment. It's a, a refreshing sight to see brahmacharis in a temple. It's not so common nowadays, unfortunately. It's in the Western world, at least. Several of our temples in India and Bangladesh have more brahmacharis than in the whole of North America. Want a competition? It's a great credit to His Holiness, Danavir Goswami, that he's brought you all together and is maintaining you all these years. I kindly received an invitation from you to come, and I thought, yeah, let's go, because I didn't see Maharaj for some years, and although I don't want to sound morbid, but the way things are going, we see disciples of Srila Prabhupada passing away, and he won't have a chance to travel, I understand. It doesn't seem very likely he's going to be traveling much. So, so many times it happened that uh, I thought, I want to see that devotee, and then next thing I hear, he passed away. So, again, I don't sound morbid, and we pray that Maharaj will be in our association for many more years giving us his association. But uh, old age and disease are warnings. And also, in the case of the spiritual master, a great opportunity for selfless service, especially for the brahmacharis who have the opportunity to do so on a full-time basis. 
in this verse from the chapter Purusha Sukta confirmed from Srimad Bhagavatam it clearly gives preference to the ashrams of renunciation or ashrams in which one is not in family life. It clearly gives preference to them for the matter of self-realization. Now, we often hear that you can be a grihasta, a brahmachari, whatever. It doesn't matter which ashram you're in. Just chant Hare Krishna. Grihe tako bane tako sada hari bale dako. Grihe baba nete take. Ha goranga bale dake. Narota mage tarashonga. So that is the proper understanding that one, a devotee is considered a devotee according to their spiritual advancement, not according to their social position. Mm. Nicha jate nahe krishna bhajane ajoga shatkul vipra nahe bhajane Joga, J Bhaje Shay Bharo Boro Abhakta Hinocha, Krishna Bhajane Nahik Jat Kuladi Bicha. When Sanatan Goswami submitted to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that I'm very low born and sinful, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu clarified that low birth is not a disqualification for worshipping Krishna, neither is high birth a qualification. Whoever worships Krishna, according to their degree of worship, they are great, and whoever doesn't is simply a fool and a rascal. So social position, uh, caste, class, gender, even species, doesn't matter if one is a great devotee. We worship Gajendra, who was a great devotee in the body of an elephant. But just as... Generally speaking, it's understood that the human form of life is better for self-realization than the elephant species, in almost all cases. Similarly, the ashram of renunciation is better for self-realization than the Grihastha ashram. In particular, here is mentioned about detachment from sex life. Srila Prabhupada writes here, the highest benefit that can be awarded to a human being is to train him to be detached from sex life. Is that the ultimate Vaishnava Siddhanta? No, it's not. The highest benefit is to reawaken love of God. So from one perspective or at one level, we can say the highest benefit is to train him to be detached from sex life. Because as Srila Prabhupada points out, in this matter of becoming detached from sex life, the Buddhists and the Shankarites, they also emphasize that. And they may be very good renunciants, some of them, but that doesn't put them on the level of even a neophyte Vaishnava Grihastha. Because in one sense, they're doing the right thing. They're becoming detached. They're doing the right thing by becoming detached from matter. But they're not focused on developing the right thing, which is becoming attached to the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. However, uh, what's being emphasized here is that one cannot properly be attached to Krishna if one is attached to this material world. And... Uh, that is accepted by all Vaishnava Acharyas. Bishoy, therefore, the, the Vaishnava Acharyas pray, Bishoy Charya Kabe Shuddha Hobe Mon Tobe Hamahera Bo Srin Vrindavan. When I give up attachment to sense enjoyment, my mind will be purified, and then it will be possible for me to actually see Vrindavan. Generally, we focus on the positive. 
developing love of Krishna, rasa varjang raso pyasya parandrishtva nivartate. Uh, if we focus on the positive, the development of love of Krishna, then automatically we should forget the lower tendencies. Vishayavinivartante niraha rasyate hinaha. But simply by trying to starve the sensual tendencies uh, will not be successful, or is less likely to be successful. But if one gets a higher taste, then he automatically gives up the lower taste. We have a problem, though, that we don't automatically appreciate the higher taste, or we don't uh, automatically uh, go up to the highest level our, our taste or our attraction is so perverse that even though we're given the great lift, gift of the opportunity to worship Radha and Krishna in Vrindavan, we remain, our, our tendency is to remain attached to everything mundane. And therefore, there is the process of surrender, sharanagati. This is the process by which Lord Chaitanya gave prem. We say, he gave, how did he give prem? He gave it by spreading the chanting of the holy names. That's true, but there's a whole process also. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Jibe Doya Kori Shaparshada Shriadham Shaha Abhatari Atantur Durlabha Prema Kori Bare Dan Shikai Sharanagati Bhaka Tera Pran. Bhakti you Nautaka know, analyzes that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, being very merciful to the jivas, descended into this world along with his holy dham and along with his associates. And wanting to give the uh, very, very rare gift of Krishna Prem, he taught the process of Sharanagati, taking shelter of Krishna. So in that process, the first two items, which could be said to encompass all the other items, or even the first one could be said, anukulyasya sankalpa pratikulyasya varjanam. To do that, to make a vow to do only that which is favorable for advancement in Krishna consciousness, and to deliberately give up all that which is unfavorable for fully taking shelter of Krishna. So here we have what is understood by all genuine transcendentalists in any tradition, that in order to make spiritual advancement, one has to give up sense gratification. And that is particularly possible in the renounced orders as a monk or a nun, uh, less so in family life because one has a license for sense gratification, which is what one is duty bound to utilize because the duty of the household is to give birth to children, which means there should be sex life. And although the householder does so dutifully, it's still sense gratification, just like we we eat food to maintain the body to serve Krishna, but there is interaction of the senses with the sense objects. And unless we're in very pure consciousness, that interaction of the senses with the sense objects, we won't be fully in the consciousness or in doing this only for the pleasure of Krishna and the tendency or the consciousness of sense gratification uh, is likely to enter. And in family life, yeah, there's uh, so much concern with this material world, home, children, wife, relatives, friends, society, friendship, love, all these things, which tend to bind one in this material world, as we know from Srimad Bhagavatam, Pumsastri of Mithuni Bhavametam, Tayaraho hridya grantimahu, ato griha kshetra su tabta vitayar, 
Janasya moho yam ahamamiti. The binding principle in material existence is the attraction between male and female, and when they actually, when a male and female actually unite, they come together, a strong knot of attachment develops on the heart, and it becomes necessary to have house, some property, one becomes attached to that, and then come children, and one needs some income, and then there's the broader society to deal with. So in this way, one is enveloped in thoughts of I, me, and mine. So becoming detached from all these things, or taking a vow of detachment from these things, is most conducive for spiritual advancement as a general principle. Nevertheless, it is recommended that most people marry. And you say, you shouldn't say that in a brahmachari class. Well, is anything forbidden to say? <laughs> That's the general recommendation because it is, after all, well, especially the, the vow to never indulge in sex life is referred to here as brihadvrata, a great vow, which seems to be very difficult. So difficult that when uh, Gangeya, the son of, or one of the sons of Maharaj, who is that, Shantanu, he, he took the vow, I will not marry, which is understood, he's not going to engage in illicit sex outside of marriage. Then the uh, demigod showered flowers on him, and he got the name Bhishma, which is a suitable name for a kshatriya, but it means terrible. But particularly it was awarded in acknowledgement of him taking such a great vow, which for a kshatriya prince, where he had all opportunity of sense enjoyment, ahead of him, but he gave it up simply to serve his father. So that was considered a great vow, if one can actually do that. On the other hand, if one, as most people are, is not able to follow that, then it's recommended that he pursue brahmacharya within grihastha life. <coughs> grihastha brahmacharya. Srila Prabhupada uses that term in his Bhagavad Gita commentary, which might seem to be contradictory. If you're a grihastha, how are you a brahmacharya? You can't be both. Well, there are brahmacharis who live in an apartment and have a job or have their own income. They're not married, but they're not really brahmacharis. Simply not to be married doesn't make one a brahmachari because brahmachari guru kule vasandanto guru hitam dasavan acharan nicho sudrira guru sudrira guru. What's the next word? Surida Guru Sohridam. Sudrida Guru Sohridam. Yeah, I'm getting mixed up between Sudrida and Sohridam, similar, similar sounding words. The Brahmachari should live in the place of the Guru in the ashram and as a menial servant, acting as a servant of the Guru not maintaining any personal interests uh, yeah, and with a, with a vow, again the word, that, that uh, vow, Srila Prabhupada used that word in the translation, that he should uh, have great regard for the guru. And, and this is from the description uh, in the Bhagavatam of the brahmacharis in the guru call and the kind of Guru call that's being described, the guru in most cases would himself be a married man. And it's described how the brahmachari should not become very close to the wife of the guru. So it's understood that the, uh, the guru is usually expected to be married. <coughs> so it's the best ashram to be in. And, and often 
uh, I'm asked to give Brahmachari classes. Uh, pretty much all I wanted to say at the time is in that book, Brahmachari and Krishna Consciousness, but there's no harm to iterate and reiterate. Brahmachari life is meant to be a, a life of training. It's the ultimate personality development course. These are very popular nowadays, personality development course. But the kind of personality development courses that are advertised, even if they include such uh, altruistic features as developing altruism, empathy, compassion, and so on, they all simply bind one in this material world if they're not clearly focused on surrender to Krishna. So to think that by developing empathy, compassion, kindness to all living beings, etc., 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 in itself is spiritual, is in, it, is in itself a misunderstanding, because spiritual means, first of all, to understand the difference between matter and spirit, and to understand that all these qualities, altruism, etc., have no ultimate meaning unless they're directly connected with Krishna and the service of Krishna. They serve to bind one in the material world, maybe in golden chains rather than iron chains, but without clearly focusing on the, on the goal of service to and surrender to Krishna, then all the so-called compassion, empathy, kindness, blah, 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 blah. It's all uh, on the mental platform. Manorat harava bhaktasya kuto mahan guna manoratena asati dhavato bahihi. It's simply on the external platform. That's for non-devotees. However, that doesn't mean that brahmachari should be callous and gross and, uh, and not develop any quality. I'm serving Krishna, so I can do any damn thing I like. No, the uh, brahmacharis, they should be models of humility as they are trained in submissiveness and service to the guru and they also have to, they have to know the etiquette of receiving guests and uh, serving superiors. Generally, the brahmacharis are expected to be young boys. So for them to take a role of servitude and submissiveness is uh, particularly suited for their age as they get as one gets older, then one's relationship with others changes. Uh, the, the young boy who was serving his elders uh, can expect to be served by his juniors when he gets older. That is the proper course. And not just to accept service, but to guide them as he, was, as he himself was guided in his youth. An essential part of Brahmachari life, absolutely essential, is studying scripture. Brahmachari, Brahmachari, Brahma here means, can mean spiritual. Brahma also refers to the Vedas. So it's essential that Brahmachari study scripture. So that should be done in Brahmachari life. Often we see in our temples that Brahmacharis are very busy, but simply being busy in service, that is required, but it's all to, uh, it, it's all part of the package. Study of scripture is required. I already mentioned that. And, uh, and then attitude of respecting authority should be there, because to make spiritual advancement, one has to respect authority. This is uh, not in the new age imagination of spiritual advancement. It's do-it-yourself spirituality. But 
the understanding that mercy comes down and I have to reach up to get that. And I have to serve those who are dispensing guidance and respecting everyone, of course, is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teaching. Now, that doesn't mean blind following of authority. One is trained in Shastra and uh, trained in how to, to understand what is right and what is wrong. Otherwise, one may learn so much Shastra, but pravritting cha nevritting cha janana vidurasaraha. If at the end of studying so much scripture, we don't know what's right and what's wrong, then we're simply a demon. And there may be devils quoting scriptures also. So we should know what is right and what is wrong. And even if one is an authority, uh, a brahmachari should know well enough, or one who's trained as a brahmachari may go on to be a grihastra of Vanaprastra and sannyasi, even though there are authorities and respectable persons, if they do something wrong, uh, particularly if they do habitually do things wrong or, or start speaking the wrong siddhanta, the wrong understanding, then according to scripture itself, they should be rejected. Guru apya valiptasya karya karya majana taha utpatta pranipandasya paritiago vidhiyate. Bhishma said this to his guru, who said, You can't fight. When Bhishma was going to fight his guru, Parashuram said, uh, Parashuram, who is guru, said, you can't, you can't fight me. I'm your guru. I, I taught you how to fight. And Bhishma said, Yeah, well, uh, a guru who is attached to sense gratification, who doesn't know how to teach properly, who used to teach properly but now isn't, uh, such a guru should be rejected. Of course, that's not a very light thing uh, and shouldn't be done on a whim, but at the same time, uh, one should not follow. One should, the general attitude of respect for authority has to be there, but it has to be on the basis of proper understanding. Cleanliness, uh, brahmachari, brahmana, the two words are both uh, based on brahmana, it is also based on, derived from the word brahma, so one of the essential qualities of a brahmana is uh, cleanliness, it's mentioned in the qualities of a brahmana, and in, in Gita and elsewhere and throughout scripture, is a symptom of the mode of goodness. Externally clean and internally clean. If one is internally clean, he will not like external cleanliness. And again, all these qualities, uh, they don't make one spiritually situated in and of themselves. One can study the scriptures and be a materialist, can be very clean and be a demon. It's also possible. But one cannot be uh, fully self-realized, except in rare cases, unless one studies scriptures, maintains cleanliness. Attitude of respecting authority, yeah, one cannot be on the spiritual platform without that. Respecting authority also means a service attitude. That should be the general attitude. Not like I see, I saw some temples that there's a, it's, all, it's almost like a contract that every devotee must do at least eight hours service a day. And then, what do you mean? It's 24 hours service, but there are just different varieties of service. Uh, so service attitude and sense control. It's meaningless to be a brahmachari without sense control. So that means all the... All the sense, vacho vegam, manasa, krodha vegam, jiva vegam, udara, pasta vegam, etan vegam, yo vishaheta, dhira, sarva mapimam, pritivin, sashishat. One is trained to control the senses, which mean eating, uh, sexual activity, all these things, and the, the urges of 
the urge to talk nonsense, the urges of anger, all these urges are to be controlled. And there are systems to control them also. One, one is trained. Uh, by entering the Brahmachari ashram, a young boy is trained osmotically, I guess we could say, by entering that atmosphere, you, you automatically pick up how others are behaving, that you, especially if it's from a young age. So if the, the boys are behaving very well, respect authorities, uh, humble, self-controlled, dutiful, that's another quality, one is given a service to do, one does it properly, uh, Later, one may marry as a, and be as a Grihastha Brahmachari, dutiful. He doesn't think that, well, this is all Maya, so I won't bother. But having entered that atmosphere, having entered that ashram, he has to be dutiful. So all these things are to be learned in the association, in, in the Brahmachari ashram, in the association of other Brahmacharis under the guidance of a guru. And of course, one of the things one has to learn is to understand what kind of association to keep because association is so important. If we have association that is detrimental to our advancement in spiritual life, then it's going to be very hard to make proper advancement. And of course, we're not always going to meet devotees. We're very lucky to be in the association of devotees. Uh, but there may be all kinds of different types of devotees also. Some may not be to exactly to our liking, but we have to learn how to deal with all different types of people, especially in this Kali Yuga, which is characterized by quarrel. So quarrel is just so normal, it's just such, such a normal part of life. People get upset over little things and Brahmachari has to learn how to deal with all different kinds of people. If he's well situated in his spiritual vows, then he will, throughout life, keep good association and try to avoid unnecessary quarrels. Sometimes in life we have to get into, as a matter of duty, we may have to get into some kind of... Uh, altercation or uh, seemingly not very nice dealings because uh, especially as one gets older then one becomes responsible or should be responsible and simply to maintain a profile of being saintly we should not shy away from issues that need to be addressed even within Vaishnava society. There may be issues which, yeah, which need to be addressed, that in the name of Vaishnavism some are misleading, are giving wrong ideas, so if one has been properly trained to know what is, knows what is the right thing to do, then uh, one should not be afraid to stand up and say what is right and what is wrong, even though one may not be very popular for doing so. So all these qualities, the, the brahmachari is supposed to be be one who has been trained as a brahmachari is supposed to be a quality person. And the thread that a brahmana wears on his shoulder, that is his certificate. He doesn't need a university certificate. If he, thread on the shoulder, he's been trained in the gurukul, and that is his certificate. That's all. Then it's expected. It's just like if one's a Harvard graduate. It's expected that he's, I don't know, well, he's supposed to be intelligent, intellectual. It's, a, it's indicative of intellectual worth. So the, the Brahmana's thread, of course the young boy has the thread, but one, one, one has been through some years of training, and he's not simply a five-year-old boy with a thread, but when he's been through, say, ten years of training, or even less, it's expected just by 
just by the fact that he's lived in the Gurukul, has been accepted, he, that means been trained day after day after day, minute after minute after minute, and knows what is right, what is wrong, how to behave in all different kinds of circumstances. So that training is uh, conducive for lifelong renunciation or such a well-trained brahmachari will make a very good grihasta and will give birth to very good children and such a brahmachari who's been trained can also later make a first-class sannyasi. And Srila Prabhupada, he wanted to establish gurukuls for training boys from a young age because those of us who have taken to the, in the Western world and in India nowadays also, those who have taken to Brahmachari life later, that means we've already been through so many experiences which are antithetical to Brahmachari life. So we have this whole thing. I'm asked to give Brahmachari classes and I suppose the main idea is how do I stay Brahmachari? How do I hang on? I know it's the right thing to do, but it's tough. And it will be tough, for, especially for those of us who were raised in a completely wrong atmosphere. And when we go outside the Vaikuntha world of the temple, we're surrounded by a wrong atmosphere. And even within the temple, thanks to the internet, even if, you're not, even if you're not looking for trouble, trouble comes looking for you. So it is hard to maintain that, but by proper deliberation and sense control, one can do. And they're, they're very simple but important principles which help, or which are essential for maintaining proper consciousness. There's, uh, rising early, daily, chanting minimum 16 rounds, simple things, but they're very powerful. And if we don't follow them, then we can't go on properly in spiritual life. And it can't be a brahmachari. Eating only Krishna prasada, and that too at regulated times, not snacking here and there. This is the life of a brahmachari. And without imbibing these principles, you can't be successful spiritually and practically not even a human being if you're just snacking here and there. If it feels good, do it. Even if it's Krishna Prasad, one has to be self-controlled. Uh, self-control training comes by rules Discipline is imposed externally. That means, yeah, get up in the morning, shower, come to the program, chant your rounds. These, these are external principles of discipline which helps us to discipline the mind within. But simply thinking, how I can, can I make it through life as a brahmachari? That's not the best attitude. The best attitude, the best motive for remaining brahmachari is to best serve Srila Prabhupada's mission because one has the, the time to do so. In Grihastha life, time is much more limited. In brahmachari life, all day, every day is only meant for serving the mission of Srila Prabhupada. So thinking of one's own self-realization or advancement, that is a good motive for remaining brahmachari. And, but over and above that thinking, there's so many people who don't know anything about Krishna, which seems to be the norm in America these days, as many people ask us, oh, what's this? As we're going around dressed like this, and we say, Hare Krishna. They never heard of Hare Krishna. Something wrong there. Uh, the brahmacharis and the grihastas, all the devotees, they should endeavor to again make Hare Krishna a household word. We 
we used to hear that term that Hare Krishna is a household word. Now it's not. So we should uh, act at least for that, not what to speak of spreading Krishna consciousness very widely, bringing more and more people into Krishna consciousness. Uh, so that that's the best motive, to, to act for the benefit of others. And people, are, people are suffering and going to hell without knowledge of Krishna. So the brahmacharis especially have the opportunity, having more time more to uh, give for preaching Krishna consciousness. So there are a few points about Brahmachai life, ideal, and in the present situation. Shall I take some questions? There may be many questions. How about this? Tomorrow, do you want to think about it and write down some questions and give them to me? And I'll look at them and think about it. And then tomorrow morning in the class time, we can go through that. How about that? Okay. Then we can read another verse tomorrow. Maybe we can do that. Brahmachari Guru Kule Vasandanto Guru Hitam. But I'm not. Yeah, we can read that verse tomorrow. You want to get that? That's in the seventh canto. So let's uh, read that verse tomorrow. Krishna willing, because. I don't know if I'll be in the same body tomorrow, or if all of you will be in the same body, but expecting that we'll all be here tomorrow. You know, we can pl if we take that as a principle that we don't know what will happen at the next moment, then you can't organize anything, can you? So presuming that we're all going to be here tomorrow, and in good enough health to attend class, then we can have I'll just give a shorter talk on this and then we have questions about this. Questions may come from the ladies' side also. They may not be very happy hearing all of this. <laughs> I don't know what they feel. I, I know when my Brahmachari book was first published, I think I'm going to get, get a lot of backlash from the, from the fair sex as Srila Prabhupada refers to them. Nowadays that would be called gender stereotyping. But anyway, I prefer to quote Srila Prabhupada than not. And what the hell other people think. And uh, I didn't. I, maybe they were quietly grumbling, but uh, some of them who read it, they also appreciate it. So Hare Krishna. We'll finish there for now.